So obviously, uh, the usual artist talk would be in the space where the art is, and um, this is not usual. So, so we put together a little slideshow, um, just kind of walking you through the gallery and, um, you know, giving that sort of broad overview. And then each of the artists will kind of, will zoom in on different pieces of our own as we talk um, moving forward. So this is just a little, to give you a sense of what we made. All right, let me pull that up and all right. Is it sharing? It's sharing. We can see Georgetown Art Center right there. It was such a pleasure putting the show together. Yeah, it's really a lovely space and so much natural light because of the, the whole front wall just being glass. Gorgeous. And so we, we had talked about this before we even finished making all of our work that we knew we wanted to um, intersperse everybody and not have like one person in one section and one person another because we really wanted to highlight that, that dialogue that our work could have because of everyone using wood grain. How did you all come to the decision to do the group show? Did you all know each other beforehand? Um, did you find each other through wood grain? Like, how did the show come about? Um, so I actually reached out to everybody. Um, I had been making more work using wood and wood grain, and I was just really interested in all the possibilities. And then I saw a show that Thomas had, a solo show at the Doherty, and he had quite a few pieces in there using um, the wood grain style. And that kind of got me thinking, huh, I wonder who else is out there. And then I remembered, I actually owned a, a print of one of Linda's, of her bumblebees that's yeah. on wood grain. And, and I'm friends with Caroline and I knew she had been moving into these sculptural pieces. So yeah, it, um, it was definitely, like an intentional I'm reaching out, but it was also one of those, like I started to just become aware of something I was already doing and seeing other people doing it and then thinking, oh, this could make an interesting show. So, so we, we got together and discussed the possibilities and looked at, you know, places we could apply to as a group. That's great. Well, it turned out wonderful thank you for sharing the slideshow with us and thank you. putting together yeah. this great group of folks here oh awesome <laughs> all right i know it's kind of a weird time like you said we would normally be doing this in person um but <sighs> we're all adjusting and so you had the idea for this show beforehand but then how was it for all of y'all putting the show together, like working on your pieces in the time of COVID and working together in the time of COVID and curating all of that? Like, I guess if each one of you would like to go through and just kind of talk a little bit about your experience in that process of just working in these strange times and how it, did it change your work for this particular show? Definitely a, a weird experience, but also like the saving thing at the same time, I suppose, like having something to really push and to get, you know, going to, um, getting in the studio, having to go in the studio every day and work throughout all of this was definitely um, a respite, I guess, or a place to go find a little bit of sanity while everything was just sort of like crumbling, you know? or feeling like it was. Um, and I think that it's changing. This is definitely changing the work that I'm doing for my next show. For this show, I, I really had like everything was already planned out. Um, so I don't think it's changing this particular show, but definitely my future work is absolutely going to be changing. And I, I want to mention also that throughout everything that's been happening, it's been also very, I'm going to say this, that's been very kind of um, understanding 
the privilege that we're having to make work about things like environmentalism is something that I really want to acknowledge like at the start of this talk um, because this show has been planned for such a long time and, um, and things are really as they are right now. I don't know. I guess that's something that I also want to really throw in. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, as Alicia mentioned, I had been working in wood grain before the concept of the show started. And at that point, it was actually a pretty new process for me. I traditionally have worked on uh, oil on canvas and haven't used many other surfaces. So I've been planning to explore in that direction and really do a lot more wood grain pieces on my own. Having a show to work towards really helped in sort of... Uh, getting everything cohesive and working toward a solid body of work that I could hang together rather than the like random experimentations of like yeah. what happens if I put this on wood grain instead of canvas. So it definitely directed me in a good way to focus on this and explore multiple different facets. And throughout the pieces of my show, you can see a bit of experimentation where uh, there, there are certain pieces that go in one direction or the other and use different colors as I was exploring this uh, style of working on wood grain. In terms of putting it together during the pandemic, I will definitely agree with Linda that it was really good to have a goal to work for forwards. I'm very goal oriented. Deadlines make things get done. So at the beginning of the pandemic, I really uh, was producing very little and honestly assumed this show would be canceled as well, so didn't even work on it until sort of a last minute rush. So it, it totally turned things on and got the creative juices flowing. It was really helpful to have something that I could push towards, be creative, spend time in that mindset, and uh, put it all together. So yeah, it, it was interesting and a, um, a bit of a challenge, but altogether definitely positive. Uh, very happy with with the fact that I was able to produce so much in this time. Yeah, and it was interesting as a group to try to navigate what a show looks like in the time of a pandemic, because I think we were actually one of the first shows to happen after the shelter in place. So we had to kind of figure out, well, what does an opening look like? Because, you know, do we encourage people to come knowing that uh, they're asking people to stay home? Do we, um, you know, what does an artist talk look like? And uh, so we actually came up with some things like the 360 tour. We actually had a 360 tour of this show shot. So, um, yeah, uh, if you follow our Instagram, there should be a link to that coming up in the next uh, week or so. But as far as, um, yeah, being a part of the show, it's been great because it, really pushed my work in different directions. Like I started combining wood with the other materials I work with. And um, yeah, I, I've been really happy with how that came out. Well, and Caroline, you um, came up against like the space you would normally work in was closed down. That, yeah. I mean, that, that seemed like <laughs> there was that challenge because of COVID. Right, yeah, exactly. Um, like one, this was even before the shelter in place, one shop that I work in closed and I thought, oh, well, I'll just work at the other. And then the following week, the other closed. And then the following week, it was shelter in place. So that was about two months that I lost in preparation for the show. So I basically had to take things I had and figure out how I could make them work for the show. So it was, mm -hmm. it was a neat challenge and, um, I think I pulled it off. <laughs> and I definitely think you did. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, I think your, your shelter in place piece that was, came out of that challenge. And yeah, I think yeah. And, we'll, and we'll, we'll make sure and give everybody a, a shot of that at some point soon. Oh, sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's totally a style I wouldn't have worked in if I hadn't uh, been stuck at home and had to find a material. To work right. with. Yeah. Um, for me, I, so, you know, I think all of us, because, you know, we did plan a lot before 
um, the virus, you know, took over everyone's lives. So we all had things planned, but we were, of course, at different stages of preparation and completion. And so I had just wrapped up a show late last year and was kind of it needed a couple months to kind of pivot. And I had my ideas and I ordered all my custom panels and was pretty much just getting started working on them um, by like mid February. And I had this really clear plan and I was, you know, up at the studio every day and, and getting in this really great groove. And then like three and a half weeks into that, was when everything shut down and I quickly made the choice to just move it all home. Um, but my backyard studio was being repaired because it had had a, a leak in the roof. So I couldn't really work for, I'd say a month plus. And, and that kind of stoppage, um, I think it did affect like how my work ended up looking because you know, I lost that sort of flow that was happening. And even though I had the ideas, things had shifted so much, like just in how I was looking at the world. So yeah, it, it was a very um, interesting process. And, um, and like everyone said, you know, there was a little while when we didn't know if we'd even have the show. And, and there was certainly a lot of other things going on in life that I was able to focus on instead. So, so I ended up, yeah, working faster than I normally would. And, and I think that that affected um, the visual of the work and, and, but I like it all. I think it's, it, it came out in an interesting different way. Um, so, but, um, and then the, the actual hanging of the show, like we couldn't, you know, Normally, I think we would have at least done a studio visit with each other at some point to see, like, what are you doing and how big is it really visually? And, you know, we could share images and we had some Zoom calls, but, you know, it was the day we took everything to the gallery on, on this Tuesday yeah. that we really saw, like, this is our show. How are we going to arrange it? So, um, yeah, it was definitely a really different process from a normal um, preparation for a big show like this. So like I'm pretty it. proud. Yeah, I think it looks amazing. <laughs> it looks great. Yeah. Uh, I guess that's one of those things when you're you have limitations and expand so much out of those limitations. It sounds like you all kind of experienced a little bit of that. Uh, it just looks like we do have more people have come in since the beginning. So I do just want to let everybody know they can ask questions at any time. You, we can't hear you, but we do have a chat window over here. And please feel free to just type them out at any point in time, if it, something occurs to you while Alicia or Kay, Thomas or Linda are talking, you're like, I have to ask this before I forget it. Just type it out and we will definitely um, get around to them. So just uh, wanted to remind everybody that that is there. And that reminds me that we totally just kind of skipped over actually introducing you folks. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we just did it in quite a roundabout sort of way. And also, who the heck am I and why am I here? I'm <laughs> Anna. Linda asked me to come here and ask the questions so they can just think about their art instead of having to uh, think about all the Zoomy things. So, hello. I like art and wood and great people. I'm an artist. That's why I'm here. All right. So, Hannah, your, your, your work is beautiful. Oh, thank you. I also have all my insects and skulls and wood grain and everything behind me. Oh, y'all just combining my favorite things and couldn't, really couldn't have a better way to spend a Sunday. So, yeah, Laura says hi to everyone, especially Linda with a heart. Hi, Laura. <laughs> Thanks for joining us today. All the way from New York. All right. So I guess we'll just, since we're kind of established an order already here, Linda, can you just yeah, like introduce yourself real quick and? Sure thing, yeah. Um, and I see there's a there's a Q and A that popped up, and um, we're all in the Austin area, Isaac. Um, um, I am not originally from the Austin area. I'm originally from New York, and um, my name is Linda Watt. I've been showing and making work in Austin since graduating from UT in 2006. Um, I've just been showing in a lot of galleries and um, art fairs and businesses, and I've been I've been at it for about 15 years, I guess. Um, and I 
did, for this show, I did push my work to get larger and a little more complicated. So I started out, I was doing these little eight by eight inch B paintings um, that uh, kind of spurred from a portrait painting that I made a while back. And I started making these little tiny B paintings because I did these big Bs in, the, in a portrait painting. And um, I painted little Bs for a couple of years. And Alicia wanted me to be in the show and, and, she, and really pushed me to make them larger and different. So I really expanded it into different kinds of pollinators. And I tried to keep most of the pollinators as local to Texas. Um, are the plants just, local to Texas as well? Um, some of them are. Some of them are um, more towards Louisiana, but still in, I'm trying to think of the name of the state park. Um, that I want to go to because I want to see them growing in their natural habitat. I can't think of it all. I should have written it down. Um, but yeah, some of them are um, not Venus flytraps. Those are only in the Carolinas, I think. Um, but um, the, the pollinators juxtaposed with numerous plants, I thought was kind of a really beautiful, like symbolic thing representing um, like growth and cycles with the wood grain and decay and just sort of the whole shebang. Um, but also presenting an opportunity to teach people a little bit, to be a little educational, which is why all of my paintings are titled after the Latin genuses of, because <laughs> um, just to sort of like get those words out there and kind of like normalize some of the scientific names a little bit. Some of them are like, there's artistic liberties taken, like one of them, uh, Compensus Euphoria is a combination of the beetle and the Cape of Venus. Uh, so it's like combining the genus from each into one title. Um, and uh, yeah. It's like, it's just, like a symbiosis between the plant and the insect feature. Or I, yeah, I thought com or. combining them was kind of poetic, you know, like taking these like strict scientific things and kind of getting, taking some artistic liberties and uh, getting, getting into exploring them from different angles, I guess, or different perspectives. It was a lot of fun. All right. All right, Thomas, you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Are you uh, Hey, everybody. Austin area? <laughs> uh, so I'm not from the Austin area originally. I grew up in Baltimore, Maryland. I uh, went to school at the Savannah College of Art and Design down in Savannah, Georgia. And I landed in Austin about four and a half years ago or so, uh, going on five years. So I've been painting, went to school for painting, have been oil painting for a very long time. Uh, as I mentioned, the wood grain series is fairly new, and I met Alicia originally, I think, through a program called Artist Inc., which was a sort of ed educational advancement program for artists to teach uh, business practices in the art field, and was really excited when she invited me along. Yeah, uh, artists are notoriously horrible businessmen, so very valuable <laughs> class. But... Um, but Yes, Alicia saw my work, invited me to the show, or proposed the idea to the show, and I loved it because I had really been kind of pushing myself to work on this wood grain and see how far I could take that concept. So it was great for me to uh, expand this work and really have something to shoot towards, see how far I could take it. And I feel like I have done that with this show and materialistically really worked to try a lot of different styles with the wood grain, do a couple of things that I was uncomfortable with, make a lot of mistakes and learn how to work with the materials so that they come out clean to a, a good finish. And um, yeah, it was great. The subject matter is pretty similar to what I was doing beforehand. The Dowerty show that Alicia mentioned was uh, labeled Nocturne and focused very much on the city at night, looking at some of the urban aspects of the city with expansion, construction, the different ways that human light affects the night scene. So I continued that into the wood grain, really focusing mostly on the human aspects of the landscape around us, and in some cases contrasting that with natural landscapes, putting that play on how humans and nature interact. So, so I know there's a lot of like construction materials and stuff, and since you already tied it in with your previous show too, um, it's like you have this growth aspect of people on the 
tree that has already been grown and cut down? Is there some kind of, why do you use, what is it that compels you with that construction imagery there? Yeah, so it's the, the wood grain, the actual grain that you see in the wood is the, um, the rings of the circle, the, the, the tree. So it's the growth rings of the tree. If you, you know, cut a stump, you can count the rings and see how many years the tree has been growing. So those lines on the wood are the actual story of the tree's growth. And on top of that, I'm showing images of our city and our community growing and with a contrast of what the natural growth is, what the human growth is, and trying to call attention to how those interact with each other, how human growth can affect that natural growth that I'm purposely letting show through the paint on all of my images. Awesome. I love that. All the things tying together. All right. Well, let's uh, let's go to Caroline for a minute. Will you tell us a bit about yourself and? Oh yeah, sure. Um, the sculpture you have hanging out behind you. Oh yeah. Um, well, I, actually, I'm I'm a bit of a, a visual person, so I kind of prepared um, some images to go with my uh, introduction. Awesome. Me sharing, and then, uh, so um, yeah. So I'm Caroline Walker. I'm a multidisciplinary artist, and um, I dabble in 2D, 3D, and interactive art. And uh, for this show, I made the sculptures. So, um, yeah, the sculptures that I made for this show combine um, materials like, um, well, they combine wood with steel, resin, and augmented reality. And um, I like to use plywood because it creates a dialogue um, between the man-made rectangular sheets of the plywood and the surreal organic forms that I shaped them into. Um, and a lot of my pieces feature a twist. I think the concept of twist is interesting because it happens when um, you have opposing forces that are pulling in opposite directions, yet they still have to remain connected. So I think that's interesting, both physically and um, visually and metaphorically. Like we've all experienced being part of something where people, where things are pulling in opposite directions, you know, like, like our political situation today, maybe. And, um, yeah, I use a lot of line. I mean, I like line. That's my favorite visual element. Um, I like line because they connect things and you can use them as a tool to lead the eye. Um, and, and they're so versatile in what they can express. Um, and I love how the lines in this piece um, suggest a rhythm and a movement. And then I use, oh, sorry, what? I said they're very dynamic. Oh, thanks. And then uh, in some of my work, I used sheet metal. And uh, so I like to bend the edges of the sheet metal into flowing organic lines that kind of play off the straight lines of the um, Baltic birch plywood. But uh, I started using wood in my art because it worked well with my process. I have a background in interactive uh, design for the internet, but I wanted to take my designs off the screen. So um, a natural transition was to use tools that are controlled by a computer. So that's like a CNC router or a laser cutter. And um, these are both tools that work really well with wood. So, um, but I do like wood because it's a super forgiving material. Like you can sculpt additively or subtractively until you get exactly the form that you want. So this particular one, you do that with laser cuts? Well, um, I cut flavor and put it together. How does that work? Oh, yeah. Well, I designed the form in a 3D program, and then I use a different program that will slice it up and make like a flat pattern to be cut out on the laser cutter. And then I glue it all together, and I have the basic shape, and then I just um, reshape the details uh, to be exactly what I want. It almost looks like you threw it on a wheel. Oh, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but, uh, this piece. But, uh, but, yeah, I like wood because um, of all the endless variations of the grain. And, um, yeah, it's just a beautiful material to use. 
But uh, as far as themes, some of the themes my work explores are interconnectivity between humans and the environment. And um, as, as we said, like, uh, I had to create uh, a lot of this work after the pandemic started. Uh, so some of it's uh, pandemic themed, like uh, this one's called phototropism, and it's about seeking light in dark times. And this is the piece we mentioned earlier, Shelter in Place, that I created while sheltering in place with uh, some balsa wood that I had on hand. Oh, the delicacy in it, really. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, it's not like I had a whole lot to do. I could work on the intricate stuff <laughs> during that time. And How um, of balsa wood did you break in the process? Of <laughs> yeah, it's a pretty fragile, um, fragile material. But I actually thought that was kind of fitting because... Um, we kind of realized how fragile life as we know it had been at that time. So, um, but yeah, um, so, so really this is about feeling far, far away from everything. And this uh, unfinished roof um, that you see here, the exposed frame, it sort of represents projects left unfinished, like the projects that I was preparing for this show. <laughs> that led to new beautiful projects, like one. Oh, sorry, you broke up a little bit. What was that? I said it's okay because it led to new beautiful projects. Like right, it took, totally took my work in a different direction. Um, so, uh, yeah, so another pandemic theme is uh, called isolation. And this is about how uh, the safety measures to slow the spread of COVID-19 have left us feeling a bit isolated. And um, so yeah, it's, it's a piece about how our connections have changed because of the pandemic and how challenging all our connections have become. Like we can't hug our loved ones and we can't care for people who are sick. So, um, but I added uh, an AR element to this piece. So if you look at this piece through my app, which is carolinewalker.art, then this is what you see. And, uh, these are hearts that are going out to everyone around the world who's suffering along with COVID. Beautiful piece. That is amazing. It's really cool to get to, to be in person with it and watching it through the, through the AR. It's a very cool experience. Mm -hmm. Sounds like there's an awful lot of technology involved in your work speaking with it's really great that this is like this is your time it's awesome oh okay. well yeah that's kind of where i i came from was you know designing all all digital so it's cool to design to uh be in a show with physical people who do physical work <laughs> it's a nice mix to have the different elements you know but I think like all of our work is, is, is fairly different. Um, and mm -hmm. it's really nice to have your sculptural pieces included with all of our, our panels, you know, it's a very nice mix. Oh yeah, well, it's great to be in a show with all of you. And uh, I just want to thank Alicia for all the work she did putting together this fantastic show. You're welcome. Thank you, Alicia. <laughs> <laughs> And I guess that brings us to Alicia to introduce yeah. her. Yeah. Well, um, you know, it's interesting. Um, the past few years, I've um, had experiences of doing um, group shows where someone else pulled them together, and and then doing a show with um, someone who was an acquaintance friend who became a very good friend in the process of making a show. And and I just yeah, I've been getting really. Um, excited about the ways my own work grows and changes when I um, spend a lot of time working on something with our other artists and so like the opportunity to do a show with with these three artists whose work I knew I liked a lot and seeing that there was this crossover point with what I do and and so I'll say I'm an abstract painter and Austin um, you know there, there are some amazing abstract artists here, but I mean, it's a, it's very different from New York, where I came from, or even Houston and Dallas. I think there's just a lot more of an abstract um, 
artwork market in those places. And so it can be a little harder for me to, to find other artists who I think, okay, there's a point of connection because just making abstract work is not like, that doesn't necessarily mean our works go together or that we'll have like an, a dialogue that um, <laughs> impacts each other. Um, so I'll share a few things images for us yes i will share a few things as i talk so i'm uh also i think those other cities just have us on more of an art market in general but it's really nice that we do have all these places that do pop up and you can get your friends together to have a show yeah yeah so i i grew up in texas and um i did live in austin when i was little um and I moved to New York after college and thought that's where I would be for the rest of my life. And I lived there for, for almost 15 years and, um, and ended up going back to school. And that's where I studied painting at Hunter College. And it was, it was really the perfect place for me because the thing that I am most drawn to in my own work is just, it's color. Like color is always my starting point. Um, it's, it's where I get my inspiration and it's also what I'm interested in trying to play with and manipulate um, to create something. And so um, I moved back to Austin about 11 years ago and um, the thing that was really striking to me was how vivid the memories of outdoor spaces were. Um, so I would go to a park with my toddler um, and, and look around and realize, oh my God, I used to go to this park when I was like six or seven and I would remember the friends I would be there with and I would remember, you know, there'd be like one old piece of the playscape left and I was like, oh my gosh, I remember that playscape. We used to always, you know, like burn our butts going down the hot slide. And um, so I, I just, um, I was really energized by seeing these, um, green spaces that had been part of my childhood. And um, I started to notice like how much the colors were coming back into my work in um, ways that I wasn't really planning. So that awareness led me to starting to think more about like, what, what am I making? Why am I making it? I've been, so I'm gonna um, pull out of here for a second and go into this one. So this is um, an older piece when I left New York, I was using um, a lot of really vertical lines and, um, you know, just kind of like processing being in the city that was just, it's, it's so vertical and it's so, oh, yeah. um, you know, the, there's so many hard edges everywhere. And so I was working through like, how do I take that visual landscape and somehow um, bring like that joy of color that I love back into it? And um, so moving to Austin, it, it pushed me to want to put more curve and movement into my work. Like that's where I felt the real joy. And so that, like this was one of the last pieces that I made on canvas. And it was this need to really move the lines. And so all of those I make using masking tape. So I'll tape off the two sides and paint the space in between. And when you're working on canvas- Beautiful you, curves with masking tape. <laughs> oh. And oh, so the, the canvas has a little bit of give and the tape wants to kind of pull up here and there. Um, and so that was what led me to wood. Um, you know, it was just purely like, I need the, the material to work for me in a different way. and I you know thought well wood isn't going to have that give i can really press the tape down it's going to stay in all the places and so you know that's how you end up with um a curve like this oh, I, so I can put that tape down on both sides and then i can yeah just like bend it and curve it um and so the wood grain became part of the work after I'd started working on wood. And then I kept thinking, I hate covering up this wood grain. It has this beautiful natural line. Um, and then, you know, one day it was like, oh, maybe I don't have to cover it up. And so then it just became a real, um, you know, just like this ongoing experiment and how do I, 
have the, the paint that I'm using um, highlight the green more and let it show through. Um, some, some of them seem to almost line up with it and some others like undulate around it. It's interesting mm -hmm. to me that you picked up working on the natural materials as you were going more into a natural environment as well. And you can yeah. see that playfulness, it really does come out a lot. Yeah, and so, you know, it, it's been a wonderful, like really natural progression because um, I am very material based. Um, being a student at Hunter College um, taught me how to think about material as art, like that that can focus of what you're making that, you know, a large field of color, um, you know, how do you control the medium and that becomes a lot of your art practice. Um, and so the more I wanted to bring nature inspiration back into my work, the more I was able to use the skills that I had been, you know, working on with the masking tape for so many years, like I was able to control it and, and do more with it. So yeah, it's been really good. Um, and you know, I, I can talk more about other parts later, but that's, that's me. All right, fabulous, thank you. Oh, all right, Linda, I'm gonna ask you to pull up some pictures and show us what sure. you're <laughs> Absolutely. Um, you got a little tease about your small bees, bee tees. So, yeah, I, I can, um, hold on. All right. I only have one left because it's the one I kept. You still have them one left. I have one left. Um, and I started with these, I guess it's sort of backwards, these tiny little, like, super hyper-realistic um, bee paintings. Let me go ahead and I'll share my screen. And I'm going to scroll through these real quick. Um, I want to show the painting that started... Um, And so what is the size of this one compared to the little bee you just showed us? I'm sorry? What is the size of this one compared to the little that bee? That was an eight by eight. eight. Sorry, I had a little technical thing. Um, that was a little eight by eight. And um, I really wanted to push them into something much larger and uh, more complex. So what I did was I kind of pushed them into much larger, like symmetrically based compositions. I pulled a lot from art deco designs and kind of like I wanted the symmetry of sort of like Rorschach ink plots for these pieces. Um, let's see if I could get this to work. And oops. so this is the original painting that I made uh, back in 2014 where I wanted the bees to sort of be these, uh, these guardians of nature. This painting is very much about our relationship with nature. And, um, Linda, can really you make that, that image larger? Because we're seeing like all the thumbnails. The thumbnail. Are you? Oh, thank you. How about this? Is that better? Still mm -hmm. thumbnails. Well, um, it's full screen for me, unfortunately. Well, maybe you're um, only sharing that uh, that browser window, and you should share the full screen picture. I don't know. Let's stop. Okay, let's stop there. Um, I just, I'll just keep saying that. Um, I so I made these giant painting, these giant bees in this painting, and I became completely enamored with the with the technical details of bee anatomy, uh, which I was completely not expecting to happen at all. I'm a very detail-oriented person. I'm a very detail-oriented painter. I like using a really, really tiny brush, and which is what I use for the majority of these. I just use a little teeny tiny little, like, brown sable brush for these, and I find it really, um, really soothing to do this very teeny tiny um, detail work. So let me try sharing this and let me know if it's working. So you use tiny brushes to make mm -hmm. tiny insects very large. Yes. Excellent. 
<laughs> Unfortunately, is this is this is it still the same as it was before? Still thumbnails. Still thumbnails. I don't know how to fix that. Unfortunately, um, we'll stop it. Um, but anyway, so uh, for the series, so what, what I pushed to make it uh, different for this series was I wanted to look at a larger, broader scope of pollinators because there's a lot of different kinds of pollinators and the symbolism that comes with the wood grain and working with pollinators um, and sort of uh, pulling the ties between them and the, the rings of the wood and having it be this representation of nature on a natural resource. Um, and just sort of how complex that can get if you think about it real hard um, in terms of humanity and what we're doing and how we're sort of affecting things. Thank you. <laughs> I'll just share some while you're talking. Thanks, Alicia. Thank you. Um, so this was actually the first one I made for the series. Um, and I, so, you know, hummingbirds, the pollinators, this one I wanted to just sort of get that Art Deco vine thing going on. I really wanted to work with the sort of the vines and the leaves for this one. Um, and it's just sort of like developed forward into different carnivorous plants. Um, so, and I wanted them to sort of represent or they do represent sort of the delicateness of nature in sort of the way that we sort of misunderstand it. Um, and also sort of reveling in the evolution of these very specified systems, like the carnivorous plants um, are, they eat bugs because they grow in very boggy areas that are not, um, that are nutrient lacking. So like, they eat flies or whatever bug lands in there because they need nitrogen. And there's just like all these really specific things happening that I find super fascinating and amazing. Um, and then for the scale of them, I really wanted to play with the scale of the elements because um, I wanted to be able to showcase these pollinators, but I don't want the paintings to be threatening. Like there's this, this drama in having them so large compared to each other and having these like the beetle here um, and the compensus on the sides, like the beetle is obviously really large compared to the compensus. So it's not really, you know, you can like kind of wonder about the intricacies of these systems and these critters without feeling the threat of the predator because these plants are predators. Um, and that's just a detail that I really love about it. And I maybe could have been a scientist in another life. I don't know. <laughs> I find, I find yeah, botany and entomology really fascinating. And that's only come through my artwork. So only exploring through my artwork have I found a fascination with these topics that wasn't there previously. Um, so the research for making these paintings was part of what was really fun and amazing about them. Uh, like the, the picture, going through and learning about picture plants and the different kinds that there are. And... Um, Find my research taking me from originally I was doing like European honeybees and for this one I did a bumblebee and discovered that there's only nine species of bumblebees in Texas and some of them are actually endangered. Uh, so if you see a bumblebee out, you know, they're like twice the size of regular bees, the European invasive bees that we're used to seeing. Um, you see a bumblebee, it's a special thing. And there's a website that you can report seeing a bumblebee too because it helps the scientists who are tracking them. Uh, that's how endangered some of them are. That, um, <laughs> so I don't know, I, just, I, I like the drama of juxtaposing the pollinators and the coniferous plants together. And I feel like there's a lot of symbolism there sort of tracing through our relationships and our relationships with nature as well. So kind of like tames, tames the insects that people are scared of and places more like, hey, nature is not ever really what you think it is. Plants may seem innocuous, but they can eat animals and yeah, there's, I mean, it's also, and that's part of the, my using the scientific names also is just sort of like trying to push a little bit about education. Um, a lot of people don't realize that if you stick your finger in a Venus flytrap's mouth to get the trap to close because it's awesome, you're like killing, the, you're shortening the life of the plant because it's not getting the nutrients it needs. Um, there's just a, there's a, the 
misunderstood. There's some misunderstanding and some uh, educational opportunities that I am enjoying putting forth. And they're just um, super fascinating creatures. And I have absolutely loved every moment of painting them and juxtaposing them together like this, like this moth and this pet, this pitcher, uh, pitcher of plants. That one, this was maybe one of my favorite ones to do. Um, the moth, all the little hairs on the moth was like super, super detailed zen space. Oh my goodness. <laughs> it went on and on. <laughs> yeah, you got every and little tiny bit of feathering in that thing. Yeah. Good gracious, Linda. Mm. Yeah. Um, it was very, uh, very, very intricate. A lot of little, each little section is like two hours. You're just like zoning out and getting into that nice, that flow, that flow state um, is something that I uh, feel very grateful to be able to experience in doing these. So. I love the subtle pinks and blues. Um, and then with the natural palette. Thank you. Um, and oh, another thing about these paintings that I should probably mention is that I did them, these are painted in layers. So I do the entire painting uh, in grays first. Um, so they're all grisaille. They're all like a, green, a gray underpainting. And then I uh, glaze color on top of it. So the moth in this one is not, but all the picture plans here were done in black and white first, like to completion. And then I glaze transparent color on top of that to give them that sort of super realistic look. It's because the paint's super thin. Um, and that was a pretty important aspect of the process for creating these pieces and having them be so tight and controlled and clean on the wood grain. Um, so that was an interesting thing that I had to challenge myself to do, but I did a couple, there's two pieces in the show that are the same painting. I have the same 12 by 12 inch painting in the show. There's two of them and they're different, uh, different tries. So like one is a direct color study and one is a grisaille study, Brazil study, um, to see which, which process I enjoyed doing more and which one would be the one that I would pick to push forward for the larger pieces. And you went with the old masters, huh? Yeah, I did. Yeah. <laughs> it just looked a lot cleaner and gave me better results, I felt. Lovely. Mm. One of these days, I'm going to have to get together with you and make bee houses for our backyards. Get a bunch of poops. <laughs> Please. <laughs> oh. Please. That would be great. Yes. <laughs> Goodness. Love it. All right, well, I suppose we should pop in on Thomas here, too. You want to show us some of your some of your works, Mr. Cook? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, so let's pull up the, uh, what up, what's going on? So Linda has these very tiny subject matters on this large scale, and Thomas has these huge construction projects, oh, a little down to these Oh, yes. Yeah. So, so much you get to see all of them. Okay. Well, this works. Um, mm. So this is one of the uh, early pieces I did that Alicia saw at my solo show. So this is 8x8, eight eight and it's um, graphite powder and oil paint. The only parts that are oil, oil paint are the little lights that you see illuminated. Very oh. little amounts of color that are just... Uh, just coming out of the wood grain. Everything else is going to be graphite powder and pencil worked on top of the raw wood. So it started pretty minimal in that I was really trying to let the wood show as much as possible and see how little painting I could do in a painting. So the same with this. This was one of the earlier ones where, again, the color has become uh, or, or is a very small part of it, just to highlight some of the humankind light that we've put into nature there. Um, let's see, I kind of have a, a lot of windows up. I thought this would be easier, but perhaps not. That's interesting. We'll get rid of this. You have the, the graphite and charcoal, which of course are natural materials, and that is all the environment side of things. And then you put in the oil paint for the light. 
of the people just yeah so <laughs> i did definitely think about that and that the the surface is natural wood the graphite powder is is pretty natural you know carbon based material mm -hmm. oil paint a lot of it does can come from natural pigments but mixed with oil becomes a little bit more of a uh, processed material so it's interesting playing with that and some of my other pieces that involve the power lines do uh, sort of push that contrast where I leave some parts wood grain and the other parts in oil paint. I'll pull that up in a sec. So this is my largest piece of the show. This is two foot by three foot. And this also has almost all wood grain. So the only oil That's paint you see here. Little ones up here. I'm sorry? I've still got the little ones up here. Little ones. Okay, cool. Adventures and screen sharing. Hang on one sec. Let me. <laughs> Looks like we got a little lag see what on we our can screen do here. share. But... Bam, we're going to just stop all that. Okay. <laughs> I want to see you. All right, let me uh, clean my stuff up here and I'll talk yeah, about it a little bit. <laughs> yeah, it's all good. Mm. Artists do yeah. technology. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Right. <laughs> Apparently, your practice runs are not, not airtight. <laughs> I guess once you get more people in here, it goes, slows down a little bit, but <sighs> that is all good. Yeah. Uh, Thomas, I really, really love your interpretation of working with the wood grain and putting yeah. it like skies and using it as your round and uh, just I really appreciate your interpretation of this and what you've been doing with it, especially with the the, um, the graphite powder and how that looks on the wood grain. Thank you. And I, okay, I think I have uh, gotten my, my hot mess of the desktop together here. I should <laughs> be able to share something with a little bit more um, no, not there. And I'd really like to show um, All right. Mary has a question for Caroline, and we'll get to that in a minute so we can do our pictures and questions at the same time. But I, I see you, Mary. We'll get there. <sighs> All right. Can you see the image here? Here, the your highway. Thumbnails. Still the thumbnails. Thumbnails. Oh, horrible. <laughs> I horrible. know. <laughs> <laughs> How about that guy? Yeah. Did it come up? There it is. Yes. All right, cool. Beautiful. So All this right. is one you where I... into the daytime from your other movie yeah. night pieces. So I started experimenting with how to how to use that oil paint with the wood grain. Uh, allowing the wood grain to show, like you, you can't cover it up once it's painted over, you can't take it away. Yeah. So I would do a really detailed drawing with all of the graphite powder work first before I touched it with any color. And then it would be a, a very painstaking process to kind of mark out where I wanted the color to be. So similar to how Linda was painting out in black and white first and then only applying color to those areas, leaving the wood grain, you know, untouched, I would do all of my graphite work and drawing on the wood grain and then only paint uh, where, you know, where I basically wasn't drawing, where I didn't need any of that to show. So in this case, it does really push the contrast between the man-made materials and the natural world and that all of the construction and highways are showing the wood grain and then the blue sky is actually the oil paint that covers up the wood grain even though that is you know the most untouched part of the the scene although there are some nice little airplane trails up there um, and do you mask anything out with tape like alicia does as well seems like y'all have similar things going on there too it's almost like a, like a stenciling watercolor yeah, so, precision sort of process. 
I, I typically do not. There is uh, one or two pieces that I use that method, but usually it'll all be with the drawing and then just very carefully trying to paint in around that so that I'm not, you know, going outside the lines, you could say, and leaving that, that wood grain exposed. Uh, there's one piece here that I'll pull up that is, um, that I did use some taping, which was, Um, let's see if it'll come up. So it seems like the, the choice to explore more daylight scenes is more about giving yourself a chance to explore color within the wood yeah, grain. Color. Yeah, it's leaving the wood grain raw, it's really hard to work color into it and make it match up with everything. So I had to kind of draw a line of like, okay, where can I add color? Where can I leave it raw wood without having a like awkward blending area? Yeah. So going back to the taping, this is one piece that I did use taping because it has some very sharp edges to it. I taped off the bottom edge of where the shadow is on the truck and some parts of the truck to get some really sharp lines. This is a very small piece. This is six inch by six inch. So it was, it was nice having that tape there to just help confine everything in the small area. Yeah. Ooh, but you do and have then, this subtle, beautiful blending up in the sky there and right around the headlights of the, ah, the little pops. Yeah, so I, I, Gosh. I found that you could, or I could, successfully blend uh, a color on top of the wood grain if it was similar to the color of the wood grain. So I could take this kind of orangey wood grain rust color in the back and build off of that with orange highlights and a little bit darker orange in the sky. But to try to, like, say, turn this sky blue, faded into blue, would uh, really just not blend so well into that natural wood grain color or stained wood grain. I do stain a lot of them. Yeah. So that was an interesting like push and pull. And then I have uh, one more I'll pull up that has, um, I kind of pushed the blend of the wood grain as much as I could. And let's see. So this piece was a good bit later in the process of making the show and I decided to make the sky orange in an attempt to really work it into the wood grain more seamlessly. So uh, sunset here blending into that wood grain color and trying to combine the two uh, without as many sharp lines. I love this piece. And how big is this one? Thank you. So this is eight by eight as well. Eight inch by eight inch, yeah. The amount of detail on such tiny spaces. Oh, I love just figuring out the similarities between how y'all work, but there's so, such different results too. It's so cool. So you have the little teeny tiny. The, <sighs> so I actually, I actually work with larger brushes, but in this case, all of the lines of the crane and the trees are done with graphite pencil. So I can get that really fine line with the graphite pencil. And uh, the brushes I use are like, so they're angle brushes, so they have that kind of chisel edge so that I can still sort of like, you know, create a pretty fine point if I need to and then cover big areas. Um, so yeah, I, I don't, quite have the patience for the super detailed brush that Linda has. Uh, I remember I had a, a teacher in college pull out this huge round brush and she was like, if you're truly Look skilled, how tiny that is. <laughs> Y'all got some finesse. It is impressive. Well, I wanted All to right. jump in because I was noticing um, 
just looking at Thomas's those last few where he had taped off some stuff, it kind of, um, you know, we both saw some interesting um, back and forth happening with the work we were making for the show. And, um, uh, you know, and to me, like, that's the fun stuff, like where things start to coalesce and, and it's not planned. It's just, you know, ideas that are finding these meeting points. And um, so two things that I did for this show that were, um, I guess I could say different or me like trying trying on something that I had been interested in but hadn't um, played with yet. So you can see with this orange uh, painting, I masked off part of the panel to leave the raw wood. And um, so this painting actually hangs with that truck painting that he showed. Um, we saw like the orange color flowing together nicely, but then also like you do get these lines that have you know, a similar feeling. Um, so yeah, I just thought that was interesting seeing his again up close. A question for Yeah, and it was, oh, uh, I was gonna say it, uh, this was touched on earlier, but the process of making this show as we were all sort of isolated, I think originally we had planned on really combining our efforts a, a bit more and really, and even collaborating on some pieces. Yeah. And it was very minimal. Uh, collaboration at all a lot of it honestly a lot of the work I saw was only through Instagram posts that the other artists would share and so it was, it was a fun almost like a puzzle when we all got to the gallery being like okay how do we combine this what looks good next to what and it, it surprisingly came together like super cohesively I was so happy with how everything kind of interwove with each other yeah. Very sweet. Very good. Um, Alicia, have you been painting around the sides of your pieces for I a while now? Yeah. So, um, so when I started uh, working on the wood panels and and realized I wanted to leave the wood grain and, and the actual grain was kind of um, helping to direct the lines at times, I I had to start thinking about well, this edge, you know, of the panel is also wood. So why am I ignoring it? What should I be doing with it? What what does it mean if I'm painting on that, you know, and it becomes almost sculptural in a way. Um, so where I am now with it is I think about the edge definitely as part of the painting. Um, and so with this show, I was able to play even more with that. So you can see like in these pieces, I've masked off, you know, part of the wood on the edge and then painted part of it or a line might curve and go around the edge. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm getting to these ideas about what we see and how um, just our own personal perspective, and it could be like our physical perspective. Like if you move, you see something that you didn't see before. And, um, you know, I think about that a lot when I'm looking at nature and how I see things that other people may not see or, um, the light at a certain time of day creates a color reflecting off a surface that isn't there later or is only in this fleeting um, moment. And so, so when I'm painting, especially along the edges, I can show a little more. Um, so I'm thinking about like, you can see how those flow around the edge and, and also with this series, I wanted the panels to have this feeling of, you know, there's a point of connection, but it doesn't always perfectly meet up or sometimes it shifts in a way that, um, you know, causes like a breakage. And so here you can see, I made like a short, <laughs> that made the sound. Um, so I was thinking about like, how do things flow together? And then also how do we, um, as viewers create lines or create um, shapes or colors that aren't there. So when we look at a panel that has one line and it moves across to another one, you know, we're creating that line, you know, it's, um, you know, you can see like they don't meet up because the panels are broken apart and yet our, our eye will often, you know, put that line into the place. Um, so I think a lot about, um, yeah, that sort of illusion of line and color and shape 
that is part of our everyday experience. And I'm, yeah, I'm just kind of trying to break it apart and look at it from a different point of view. Um, so this series, it was 47 panels total. And I was thinking about this literal connection of the wood and those grain lines being a document of a tree's lifetime and how many years it had been alive. So, you know, I just thought, oh, well, that's an interesting like way to start. Like, how old am I? I'll make 47 pain paintings and see like, what does that feel like to think about it as, you know, some sort of abstract document of my own life. Um, so working on these during the pandemic was definitely, um, you know, I, I thought a lot about like, what does it mean to, to have a life and to have what is our everyday life kind of halted um, and how it changes our perspective on what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, and then the other big piece that I made was um, this multi-panel uh, laser cut, had them custom made. <clears throat> so this is- ask, did Caroline implant the idea of laser cutting? You know, I, I think there was definitely like learning about her process got me thinking, you know, even if I can't do this myself, and initially I was sort of like, maybe I'll learn how to do this and then I'll make my own pieces. And, you know, there's time constraints in life. Um, <laughs> but so I hired someone to make these. Um, and yeah, I, I was definitely feeling like this was this sort of hybrid of a painting that's sculptural. And, um, and so I also wanted to think about since the the show was ingrained and it's about us using wood grain like how far could i push that as a two-dimensional painter and so i tend to work on squares um because i'm thinking about like all the lines that are inside of that shape and so being able to have the edge cut to follow the wood grain was like just pushing that further of making the wood grain just so important to the work. Mm -hmm. um, it was really interesting working on these because, so this is, um, the original wood is four feet by four feet. And so this is all cut out of the same piece of wood. It's all cut from the same piece of wood and you can see like, you know, they really do, um, you know, I had them cut out some spaces cause I was also yeah. thinking about the lines that we see in nature that are created by cracking and erosion um, so this whole series was taken from just time that I, I spent at the Violet Crown Trail, which is a green space near um, where I live. And <clears throat> I took a lot of pictures down there. And so I used colors of plants and trees and rock and, and even just skylight at different times of day as the inspiration but the shapes were definitely from that, you know, the cracked rock. And I liked, I, you know, I did this other new thing where I, you know, highlighted just like one shape, wood grain shape and left that raw, and, you know, sort of mirrored it on some of the other pieces. Um, again, like just trying these new things, knowing that, you know, I really wanted to just bring out like, what is the wood grain and what can it do with the painting? And then here you can see like, I'm thinking a lot about those lines that break and how, you know, we, we fill in those gaps um, as the viewer. Gestalt in motion. Yeah. And then the end, like, like, we, like, we come together and these colors just all play back and forth, like our work, you know. I think it's such an interesting time for y'all to have this in brain show like as we're talking it really reminds me of um how trees have these interconnected root systems and while you're all these separate entities you're still playing off each other the way the trees would and you know normally we get to interact with each other physically and trees don't and now here we are in the tree position of not being able to physically interact with, interact through a uh, shared resources and y'all have done this so beautifully now we do have this question from caroline's big very curious fan 
Sorry, very, not big. She's very curious about um, you pushing yourself into larger and larger scale things as well. So Mary's asking, um, given your engineering background and decades in NYC, have you considered scaling up your ideas to larger outdoor installations or architecture? And when uh, actually, yeah, yes, I have. And I've done several proposals and uh, yeah, I just love uh, the concepting itself is just like such a fun process. Um, but I'm told you have to do hundreds of proposals before you get one accepted. Well, several proposals, but it's a uh, it's fun just to concept art on that scale. And um, so yeah, I'd love, I'd love, I'd love to do public art. And actually, that's where I met Alicia in a public art class. <laughs> and, um, yeah, so uh, as soon as I get the funding, I'll do it. And um, if anyone out there wants to fund me, uh, <laughs> you've got my contact um, info. Yeah. <laughs> I look very forward to your first large scale pieces. Uh. <laughs> Absolutely. So, what led you into um, augmented reality? Like, using. Well, um, yeah, it was kind of neat because, um, you know, uh, like five years ago, all my artwork was on the screen. I had never done any physical. Well, I mean, I had always uh, done things like drawing and painting, but I had never done any type of physical sculpture. And um, so I learned how to use tools so I could do physical art. But then I discovered augmented reality and I'm like, oh wow, I can use AR to augment my physical art. So it was kind of like it'd come full circle. It's kind of a natural progression of just yeah, it was like I went from digital to physical, and then I realized I could also do digital on physical. So, <laughs> oh. and I and, and I and I do like um, interactivity because uh, that was having a background in um, interactive design for the internet. You have to think: how are people going to interact with this this web page or? what have you. So it was kind of a natural way uh, for me to think. So does your heart pendulum swing yeah. in real life as well? Yeah, um, yeah, it does. Um, uh, I'm eventually going to motorize it, but right now you have to push it and then it swings back and forth. Um, but actually the inspiration w for that was um, right before uh, everything went nuts, like right before everything closed and we had a shelter in place, I, um, I was asked to do my first collaborative um, AR project, which I was super excited about. And that was to um, put an AR animation on a dancer for a, for a salon. It was like a collaborative thing for a salon. And I thought it would be so cool. So then since, of course, you know, we couldn't do that, I thought, well, let me see what AR looks like on a movie object. And so that's how that came answer? about. Answer? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> would you mind pulling that up for us again? Oh, the, the, uh, the shelter in place? Um, the, the, I mean, the isolation? The isolation, yeah. Sure. Uh, And I know you said it's just kind of a natural progression of digital to physical to digital again, but um, I mean, I just, I really love this piece and I want to see it in person and have its hearts come out and hit me. And <laughs> oh. I feel like that is obviously very intentional. That doesn't happen on its own. Um, when you went into making it, so this was spawned out of not being able to do the dancer piece? Well, I mean, I have added AR to my sculptures for a while, but I'm the, thinking about doing the dancer piece that made me think about how would it work on a moving person or yeah. in this case, a moving object. So it, it, uh, it kind of creates a more expansive flow of hearts out, of, of thoughts and prayers out to the world, the swinging. 
I love it. Me too. It brings me a lot of joy. <laughs> it's really cool to be able to interact with your audience. It is. You walk up to them, and then you need the app, and then it's a whole other element added to it. It's just, it's, it's so fun. Well, and I feel like I should say, I mean, we had our opening yesterday, and um, the gallery is open just one day a week on Saturdays from uh, 10 to 6. But people can definitely reach out to me, and I can do private tours. Like, I can open up the space really anytime and, um, and bring someone in, just like just the two of us, if that's something that, you know, feels safer and, you know, meets more of your personal needs. So and what I was really I encourage anyone who wants to see the show. Georgetown is like, it's a 35 minute drive from South Austin with, you know, no traffic. So I would love to, to get people to see the work in person because, you know, there's so much detail, um, you know, the experience of the AR with Caroline's work, but then also just like getting closer in and seeing how that wood grain plays into, you know, just all the different images that we've created. It, you know, it's, yeah, it's really fun. So please reach out if you want to go see it, not on an open gallery day. Do you have um, an email or contact that you would prefer people to use for that? If you could put it up in our, in our chat window, just so. Yeah. Everybody who wants to contact Alicia and get in there and enjoy all these beautiful lines converging together in person can do so. I set up right now. And it's it's my personal email that I use for everything. So if you already have it, that's it. And then there, I think I just shared it. Yeah. Cool. Oh, fantastic. Ooh. And Alicia, I'm sorry, the gallery, I thought it was open 12 to 6 right now. Is it 10 or 12 that it's opening? Um, no, I believe it's 10 to 6. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. For websites, that's right. More viewing hours. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> so, like, they're, they're being safe, masks are required, limited capacity. So, you know, you would never walk in and feel like, oh my gosh, it's so crowded. But, um, but again, I understand some people really need to limit um, their exposure. And so I'd be happy to accommodate. And then the 360 virtual tour should be out in the next week or so that you can view anywhere. You don't even have to be in Austin to come see it. Yeah, so I, we should have, I'll put the website, but we'll have the link, you know, as many places as we can put it, but um, ingrained ATX is our group website. And the link will definitely be there. And I would say, um, you know, by Wednesday or Thursday at the latest. Um, yeah, and, th and that will stay online even after the show comes down. Um, kind of, yeah, I'm excited about that. Again, it's like this interesting time. We've had to figure out how to use technology to have a show online that's also in real person, that's in real life, because we know a lot of people can't get to the real life shows. So. Um, yeah, it's, it's strange, but hey, I think it's kind of cool. It's pretty exciting. I've definitely used uh, technology more in the last couple months than literally ever in my life. And here we are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, right. it's definitely a learning experience. Uh, does anybody mind if I give like one more little go at bringing up some of my paintings Easy. in a larger. Sure. Yeah, I'm just gonna, I, I'm just gonna just go straight for. Um, let me see if it will work, and I don't know that it will. Not. We all like looking at your art. That's why we're here. Mm. Thanks. Uh, oh, let me give it one more try. How about that? Is that a large person? Yeah. There? Yay. Okay, cool. So there's that one. That. And then let's try this one. I'm seeing, are you seeing this? Can you see that? Still on the moth. Still on the moth? Mm -hmm. I think you have to click on, once you open the window, I, have, I think you have to reshare. You have to click sharing and share just that window once it's open. Let's try it. Okay. Uh, 
let me just, I'll just go ahead and do this then. Because there's one that I don't think I, how about this one? Are you seeing a large for the ping that's no? I would stop sharing and then start sharing again. And when you see the, the window that it's big, where that one's big, click on that window. Because right now it's thumb, thumbnails. The thumbnails are great. Yay, I'll post them all online. You can see them on our website. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or just come up to Georgetown and, and see. Yeah. Beautiful. <laughs> Oh, I do love the texture on that bat's wings. Like you can just feel the tension and the tightness of that skin, just ready to fly off and pollinate some big night flowers. <laughs> <laughs> Make tequila. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and bring it to me. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, um, I guess. <sighs> I'm not sure if we want to like close out or if there's anything anybody has like last minute things you want to add in. Um, I feel like I made it through most of the questions I had here. Um, I guess, was there anything that really surprised you or that you've like come to learn about yourself and your process through this that you're excited to take on to your next show or things you might be have been inspired through the show to take on to the next one. And then we kind of talked about that a little bit at the beginning, but it feels like a nice way to kind of full circle things to uh, go off into the future after this. If anybody wants to jump in. This definitely pushed, uh, definitely taught me a little bit about my work and my process because I typically do figure paintings and I always have to go through that middle phase of the painting where I hate it. And what I'm doing is terrible, and <laughs> it's not going to look good. And then I get to the end of the painting, and I figure everything out, and it's great. Uh, but there's always that like period in the middle where everything is just awful. And I didn't go through that with the series at all. And so the entire time was just like smooth sailing for the most part, and just you know getting my problem solving done, and then moving on. Um, so that was really nice. <laughs> that I want to say. <laughs> just, um, it was a really pleasant process. I, you know, I put a lot more into the front end of it and the planning and sort of like doing little thumbnail sketches and getting everything, you know, that process of, uh, that I feel like lets you go smoothly through it. Um, and that was definitely a learning experience to me. So I would like to thank Alicia for inviting me to do this show because it definitely taught me a little bit more about my process and a better way for myself to work. So thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, um, I'll jump in next. Um, yeah, I mean, doing those cutout pieces was a real pushing of, you know, visually what I was doing and also just thinking about um, what am I uh, creating as a two-dimensional artist and and you know again like I felt like I was sort of just right on this edge of is this three-dimensional work and and how far do I want to go past that line so I'm you know I'm really excited at the possibilities and I actually already have um, a commission to do a larger cut piece um, that is, yeah, it's going to give me some more chances to figure out, like, how do I work on that? And what am I um, trying to convey with something that's a panel, but cut into these shapes? Um, you know, I mean, I, I think that it's, it's nice to be in that place where you can sort of start the work and know where it's going to lead and, and finish a piece and have things go smoothly. Um, but sometimes you need that next, okay, I need to feel a little like, I don't know what's going to happen and I don't know how this is working and I got to figure it out. And um, so I'm ready for a little more of that. Yeah. Do you think that you and Caroline might have a, a three-dimensional collaboration in your future? I would love to talk about that. So well, that's, yeah. been thinking about that makerspace and wanting to go there with you when it, when the time is right. So, yeah. I just want to plant that seed because I want to see it. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Thomas? 
Yeah, so I, I learned a lot about my process with the wood grain uh, in trying to combine the, you know, the um, painting and drawing aspects together. That was really something I kind of had to experiment with the whole way. And uh, I'm, I'm really happy with how far I came with it, how I've kind of been able to dial it in. And I'll like share one more thing here because I can. Mm -hmm. um, oh yeah, I love this one. So, it's gorgeous. Yeah, so th this one you might have seen on some of the promotion, but it, it took a lot of, like I said, a lot of drafting beforehand. All of the wood grain and graphite powder was done before any of the painting happened. So it's a very planned, very like, uh, precision, like make sure I know where everything is before I start painting. And I enjoyed it. I really like where I've gone with this series. I think I'll continue this series in some way. But what I'm taking from the show and what I'm really excited to work on next is going back to oil on canvas where I can be real messy. <laughs> and I'm so, so excited to get back to some more painting and, um, just kind of go back to that side of my practice that has been on the sidelines. So a little bit of like pendulum swimming, swinging back and forth there where I got to experiment with this one really different style of drafting and painting. And I think the next series might, uh, you might see some bigger brush strokes and uh, looser imagery, which, which I think will be great. So uh, we'll see how that goes, but that's uh that's the next step for me, I think. Mm. I'm glad you pulled that one up there. I wanted to ask you about that title on that. Um, so it's called Preparing for Floodwaters? Yeah, so th this was an image taken from the Walnut Creek Trail, which comes off of uh, the southern terminus is at Go Valley Park. And it's right by a uh, spillway there, like a little creek. I forget the name of the creek. But at one point when I was going along the trail there, they had, uh, from that imagery, they had some backhoes digging out all of the mud and silt that had built up on that spillway, like clearing it out so water could flow through there, which I assume, and I, I do not know this for sure, was to, you know, have the spillway more effectively control floodwaters yeah. in that area. So uh, in this case, not only humankind trying to build and expand, but also trying to control nature and, uh, figure out how to work with the forces of nature. But it was a, a very sort of bizarre scene to wander along while I was hiking that they were, you know, digging up a riverbed uh, right below the trail. So. No kidding. It's also a rather poetic thing to end on because you're preparing for the flood waters of all the new things you're going to create for us after this. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. All right. And Miss Caroline. Oh, I'd like to... Well, I work well under pressure, so um, it's always great to have a show because I don't, like, try to second-guess everything. I just push ahead and do it. And, um, yeah, it just teaches me that, uh, yeah, if you push ahead and do it, then uh, it'll come out. <laughs> oh, no better lesson to learn in life, really. <laughs> Make it, and it'll be awesome. And then it'll get even more awesome each and every time. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. well, I want to say thank you to everyone who showed up for our talk. Um, yes. it's really nice to, to, to have this after all the work we've done creating the show and just to be able to share and, and um, yeah, have a conversation and um, know that there's some people listening. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank you. So, yeah, so thank you all for being here. And, and I also, yeah, just want to say thanks to the Georgetown Arts Center um, for letting us keep our show. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, keeping the space as much as they can, given how um, difficult that is for a lot of spaces these days. So, yeah, definitely. It's such a beautiful space. There's so much good light in there. And uh, it's just been, it's, it's just, it's so nice to be able to present our work and to be able to, you know, it was a lot of a lot of work to figure out how to present our work to people and just being able to have all these different resources to do so has been uh, really nice. So it's just sort of grateful for the technology for us to be able to even do this, you know. Um, and 
And thank you also to you, Anna, for helping us today and doing my pleasure <laughs> leading us through. <laughs> It's wonderful. I, like I said, no better way I could spend my Sunday than getting to talk to incredible creatives and see your great work. And now I get to take it and be inspired and jive back into my own workspace. So thank you all for what you do. I mean, you may think like, how lucky for us, we still get to have the show, but really it's lucky for the rest of us because we get to see all the beautiful things that you've made. And um, Just thank you. Thank you all for such incredible work that you're putting out and being being such a great community keeping us all ingrained <laughs> well, put. well said <laughs> all right well i guess I've, i feel like we've capped that off quite nicely so yeah thank you so much everybody yeah, thank you for everybody thank, thank you, you. <laughs>